Washington crossed the Delaware. Caesar crossed the Rubicon. Each one did it for a different reason. One to stop an empire, one to start one. But it's safe to say that few people were ever as ill-advised to cross a river as King Croesus, who appears to have done it just to see what would happen. You may recall from our previous episode that in the early days of the Median Empire, just after they had defeated Assyria, they began a war with the Lydians. A battle only stopped because of an eclipse which made everyone think that the gods might be ever so slightly upset with everyone for engaging in so much fighting. A hastily put together treaty between the two combatants left the Halys River, now called the Kizil Irmak in modern day Turkey, as the boundary between the two empires. And so everything remained, the Lydians on one side and the Medeans on the other, relatively peaceful for the next 30 or so years. Then of course the Medes under King Astyages went about the business of empire building in other directions, established a capital in the Zagros Mountains at the gateway to the Iranian plateau called Ekbatana, and in the process managed to upset a fair few citizens of the empire. Eventually, resentments built up until, seizing an opportunity prophesied in the king's dreams, key figures in the Median Empire, notable among them the deeply and tragically insulted commander of the Median troops Harpagus, decided that the best thing to do in the face of the upstart Persian revolt led by the king's grandson Cyrus was to essentially revolt themselves, capture Astyages, and hand him over directly to Cyrus. Having won the battle, destroyed the Median Empire, and captured the former king, Cyrus decided to buck tradition and not execute anyone and everyone who stood against him, but rather to pension the king off into retirement and make the Medes full partners in the new Persian Empire. And so, the Persian Empire begins, and we learn how to summarize two days worth of script writing in a 20 minute episode into a less than three minute recap. But of course, with the Median Empire gone, the Lydians are no longer under a treaty with anyone, and their status has been left a bit unclear. King Croesus found himself asking a basic question which, to put it in the words of that famous and well-known late 20th century English philosopher Mick Jones, amounted to, should I stay or should I go? King Croesus, you may remember from our episodes on coins and electrum, is credited as the inventor of coinage and also as being probably the richest person alive at the time, which, you will also recall, made it very easy for him to buy any size army he might care to have. What makes it all so odd is that apparently he couldn't add one to one and reliably come up with two as an answer. See, he'd fought the Medes once already. He knew how strong their army was, relatively speaking. Sure, it had been 30 years before, but since then, the Median army hadn't got any smaller or any less successful. They kept going from one victorious campaign to the next. That was the first one. The second one was that as far as anyone in the area was concerned, the Empire of the Medes had been more or less wiped out in one relatively fell swoop by a group of people no one had ever heard of before. The Persians were an unknown quantity, and to emphasize the point here, they had just wiped out the Medes. One plus one, what does it equal? To Croesus, it apparently equaled, I wonder if anyone left anything laying around for me. Let's go and see. And so, on the heels of the Persian victory, Croesus marched a massive army across the river Halys and into what had been the Median Empire, but was now the Persian Empire. In response to which, Cyrus would speed march his men down from the Zagros Mountains and right to the Halys, where, there being no eclipse to spare anyone this time, he fought Croesus to a standstill until winter came. At which point, according to the polite rules of empire versus empire combat, both sides were supposed to withdraw back to their homelands to pick up the fighting again in the spring. Instead, Cyrus decided he would rather win than go home and try again another day, and chased the Lydians all the way back to their capital of Sardis where, thinking he was safe, 
Croesus sent the majority of his hired troops home for the holidays. Imagine his surprise when Cyrus knocked on the door and said, Guess who? At which point, the Persians happily added the now former Lydian Empire to their holdings, making the Persian Empire the largest ever seen. This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Now, some people can be really ungrateful after they're conquered. To prove the point, look at the Medes. They were entirely happy to be under Persian rule. In fact, they'd been particularly instrumental in helping to capture Lydia, largely because they were a people used to the harsh winters and fully prepared to prosecute a war in the bitter cold. It was they, and particularly Harpagus, who had helped secure victory against the final cavalry charge of the Lydians. The Medes were in partnership with the Persians, very nearly equals among them and happy to be so. And consider, Cyrus offered the Lydians the same deal he'd offered the Medes. Throw in with me, become part of the Persian Empire, and we'll all get along splendidly conquering the rest of the world. You genuinely can't lose. Look, I'll even make old Croesus here part of my entourage and leave all his wealth right here in Sardis. You guys can even be in charge of it. You can't ask fairer than that. And at first, the Lydians all nodded and agreed that it was more than reasonable, and frankly, probably more than they deserved for intruding on the Persian Empire. Excuse us, please. Somehow, though, the Lydians must have heard a different message. Because in the back rooms, among the very folks Cyrus put in charge of the treasury, word went around that the Persians were clearly weak, and that all they had offered was just appeasement to prevent the Lydians from rising up and attacking them right back. Clearly, we are secretly in a position of strength, even though most of our army has been entirely wiped out and the Persians barely got a scratch. We just need to reorganize and crush the Persians with... Well, with whatever it is we have, they are secretly very much afraid of. There must be something, right? Let's revolt and see if we can figure out what it is. When Cyrus got back to Ecbatana, he was almost immediately followed by the news that the Lydians were revolting. And when you're the sort of person who starts out by saying, Look, I know we were at war and all, but that doesn't mean we can't be friends after it's all over. You tend to look unfavorably on those who renege on the offer once accepted. So back out the door go all the nice fresh troops who'd just been hanging out in the capital while everyone else was conquering Lydia the first time. Except now they have some very specific orders about how to respond. Level everything, kill anyone who argues, and make slaves of the rest. It's their own fault. And so the army did. But let's not forget how successful the first campaign against the Lydians was. The Medes had really shown themselves well, and Harpagus was up for special commendation for suggesting that the final battle of the first campaign be fought only after the charging Lydian cavalry had passed through a line of stinking, grumpy, obstinate Persian pack camels first, which had so frightened the horses that the charge was broken before it even met the enemy, allowing the Persians to pick folks off at their leisure. In appreciation, Cyrus elected to send Harpagus west to take charge of the Persian troops there. Harpagus couldn't have been more delighted. Here was an opportunity beyond his wildest dreams back when Astyages was king. He even got a new title along the lines of Generalissimo of the Sea. And so pleased by all this was Harpagus that not only did he see the Lydians off the map, he kept right on going until he'd reached the shores of the Aegean. There he found the Ionians, living in scattered cities, and resolutely conquered all he could find of the disorganized former Greeks. Harpagus was so effective that many Ionians simply ran as far and as fast as they could back across the Aegean, some as far as Italy. So brutal was Harpagus's conquest in the name of Cyrus that the Greeks would forever conflate the Persians of Cyrus with the Medes of Harpagus. And so the Persian Empire grew even more. While that was going on, Cyrus took it upon himself to clean house a bit. Sweeping eastward along the Khorasan Highway, he pushed on until he reached the Hindu Kush Mountains and Central Asia, conquering as he went. 
he pursued the same policy he had with the Medes and had attempted with the Lydians. The conquered were invited to join the Persian Empire and benefit from close association with her. And as often as not, the terms offered were accepted. Which was good, because if Cyrus had one significant worry, it was that those nomadic Aryan tribes that had produced what were now the Persians might also produce another such group to challenge Cyrus's hold on the world. But by getting those closest to his borders to submit to Persian rule, he built up a buffer zone through which anyone seeking to challenge the empire would have to pass first, and thereby present ample warning of their approach. Provinces from the Hindu Kush mountains in Afghanistan to the Aral Sea in Kazakhstan were brought under just as much control as was needed to assure loyalty, but otherwise allowed to carry on largely as they were before. Upon finding himself one day on the banks of the Sir Daria, or Jazartes River in Central Asia, Cyrus called a halt to his advance. There he set up seven cities to guard the eastern approach to the river, and returned home to Pasargade in 540 BCE, satisfied. At least, satisfied about the east and west. But now, with those borders settled, Cyrus, who by now had earned the title Cyrus the Great, turned to the lands between Assyria and the Persian Gulf. So south he went, and as he went, he proclaimed to those he encountered that he was defending the land and bringing peace. The people he would be confronting were no slouches, no disorganized barbarian tribes. Rather, they were at least as sophisticated as Cyrus himself, and probably even more accomplished at political maneuvering and statecraft than he was. They wouldn't be easily taken in by his usual tactics. But when a man comes at the head of an army offering to protect your lands, not attack you, and thereby establish peace, well, it's hard for the common people to resist. After all, to deny those were Cyrus's goals would be to openly declare that you did not also want peace. Besides, with the size of the army Cyrus was leading, peace was definitely what everyone wanted. And so, they let him into their cities and agreed to become, if not exactly Persian, then Persian by association. To all these people, too, Cyrus offered a partnership, a mutual understanding, and aside from dealing with those who actively resisted, by and large, life could continue as normal. Even the local priests of the various temples soon understood that Cyrus was both righteous and just, and that all his empire and his right to rule it came from the gods as his just reward for remaining faithful. And indeed, so it seemed to be. If you need further proof of Cyrus's suave statesmanship, take a look at 2 Chronicles and the book of Ezra in the Bible. The Babylonians wreak a hard vengeance on the people of Judea when they conquer them and burn their temples. Nebuchadnezzar tears down Jerusalem's walls and then takes the people captive. He then removes them all back to Babylon, where they live in exile for many years. But then Cyrus comes to power in Persia, and as part of his expansion of the empire, he marches down to Babylon, conquers it, and in short order turns all the Jews loose again, off to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. Not coincidentally at the same time, creating a people so grateful to him and so convinced of his divine inspiration that Judea is more or less a secure hold tied to the Persian Empire for the foreseeable future. It all agrees with prophecy, of course, which was extra helpful in selling the idea. But then, that's part and parcel of what Cyrus did, present himself as the fulfillment of a god's plan, any plan, of any god, among the people he conquered. Eventually, of course, Cyrus died. How exactly is not known, just that he was on campaign at the age of 70, north of the seven cities he established to guard the Sirdaria, when he fell victim to one of the tribes the Persians were fighting. Supposedly, the queen of the tribe that killed him had him decapitated and dropped his head into a full wineskin in order to slake his insatiable thirst. The thirst of a night demon, according to some in the Near East. Opinions elsewhere differed, however. Among those who submitted to his rule, he was admired. According to Persian fire author Tom Holland, Cyrus, the man who had convulsed the world, would be remembered with an almost unqualified admiration for his exceptional nobility of character 
and as the architect of a universal peace. For centuries afterward, even among its bitterest enemies, the glow of its founder's memory would suffuse the empire of the Persians. He eclipsed all other monarchs, either before him or since. Such was the verdict of Xenophon, an Athenian, writing almost two centuries after Cyrus's death. No matter whom he conquered, he would inspire in them a deep longing to please him and to bask in his good opinion. They found themselves longing to be guided by his rulings, his and no one else's. What then would become of the empire Cyrus built without Cyrus at its head? Fortunately, Cyrus had fathered children, three daughters and two sons, and Cyrus had taken care to delineate the succession to the throne. The older son, Cambyses, was to be crown prince, and the youngest son, Bardia, was to be governor of the largest and most important eastern province, Bactria, and that without having to pay tribute to his brother. Cambyses would rule, and his brother Bardia would be as a lieutenant to him. Bardia would guard Cambyses' eastern provinces from attack, and in exchange, Cambyses would leave Bardia strictly to his own devices. But Cambyses was just as interested in conquest and expansion as his father had been. Since he could not go east without impinging on his brother's lands, he was forced to turn his attention elsewhere. Which was fine. The empire needed an injection of wealth to keep her affairs in order, and the eastern frontier held little promise of greater riches than had already been wrung from it. In fact, there were a few places still remaining in the world that could rival the already incredible wealth of the Persian Empire. Save one. To the west lay gold and riches unimagined within the ancient lands of Egypt. In order to make the attempt, Cambyses spent the next four years preparing, and part of the preparation was to build a naval fleet capable of dealing with the ships the Egyptians were known to have. The first such fleet the Persians ever had. Spies were sent to learn what they could about their soon-to-be opponents, and the information gathered was of such a quality that it was said the Persians met the Egyptians in their first battle with cats pinned to their shields, because the animals were sacred to the Egyptian archers, and they would not fire on them. In due course, by carefully coordinating over land and sea, Egypt fell and greeted her new pharaoh. In the long run, though, Egypt proved tricky to hold. Cambyses found it difficult to swing the Egyptian priesthood into line and get them to pay their taxes. In the end, it took four years of brutality to get them to pay, but in return, the Egyptian priesthood painted him as a savage lunatic who mocked the Egyptian gods and spitted a sacred bowl believed to be divine. He hadn't, of course. Like his father before him, Cambyses worked to show respect to the Egyptian gods and follow as much as possible their traditions, complicated though they were. But by then, Cambyses had been away from home for eight years or more. Whispers had begun circulating among the Persians that Cambyses really was mad, that he had forgotten his roots, that he was, perhaps, becoming more Egyptian than Persian. In part, these rumors may have started because Cambyses feared for the security of his position, and so brooked few arguments and tolerated no opposition. Rumors flew about needless savagery and terrible revenge. Back home, as Cambyses began demanding more and more from his distant subjects, people began thinking about alternatives. And of course, there was only one real alternative, patient Bardia. In 522 BCE, Cambyses finally decides to head back home. Not only had he conquered Egypt, finally, but he'd taken Libya and Ethiopia as well. But perhaps it was all a bit late. The waters at home were already stirred and preparing to boil, and by now, Bardia was turning up the heat. In March, Bardia claimed the Persian throne from Bactria, and a scant month later, the rest of the eastern provinces threw their support behind him. It seemed certain that once he returned home to Persia, Cambyses would have a fight on his hands to retain the throne. And then he died, much to everyone's apparent surprise. The story was, and to some extent still is, that one morning while rushing back home across Syria, 
Cambyses leapt onto his horse and wounded himself through the thigh on his own sword. You can figure out the mechanics of that. We certainly have a hard time of it, and we're willing to bet that at the time, a lot of other people did as well. The wound turned gangrenous, and Cambyses died within just a few days. How nicely convenient for everyone, especially Bardia. By July, he was officially on the throne. He married his brother's widow, and having secured the line, retired to Ecbatana for the summer. Which only left a few problems to deal with. See, Cambyses may have been dead and Bardia comfortably sitting on the throne, but Cambyses' army was still stopped midway between Syria and the Zagros Mountains, with nothing to do, and no one in charge. All the highest-ranking officers, who were also some of the richest nobles of the empire, had, of course, been through the entire campaign in and around Africa. They knew all about fighting and the application of power, They'd certainly seen the king exercise it often enough. And among them was a humble lance-bearer named Darius. Except perhaps not all that humble. He was a cousin to the king, and that gave him rank and prestige just by association. He knew things as part of Cambyses' inner court that others did not. And it just might be that he knew a lot more than he let on and was able to analyze what was going on back home and with the new king, and derive several useful conclusions from it. See, as much as the eastern provinces might love and support Bardia, the Persian Empire still needed funding. Funding that Bardia couldn't reasonably burden his supporters with. It would seem ungrateful. And after all, why raise their taxes when there were much richer targets on the wrong side of the new royal dynamic now? Why not raise the taxes on all those nobles who had left with Cambyses and were now conveniently sort of stuck out in the wilderness unable to protest? Surely that couldn't be a problem. Let's just confiscate all their land and cattle and slaves and whatnot, and that'll do for now. Well, it certainly did do for now. As soon as the news got out, it split the Persian Empire. Suddenly, Bardia, who had been the pick of the royal litter as far as the people were concerned when they were worried about Cambyses, became a disgrace to all Persians, his country, and his throne. But what were they to do? A second king dying in the same year might be enough to destabilize the entire empire and create factional infighting, tearing it apart. Well, all you had to do was find the right person to step into Bardia's shoes, and fortunately for all concerned, there was such a man almost guaranteed to be a perfect fit. Young Darius. And equally fortunately, Darius already had a plan in motion. Thanks for listening to this episode of GM Word of the Week. We've still got two more episodes in the Persian series to look forward to, and we hope you are as excited by that prospect as we are. As ever, we remain humbly grateful to our supporters and backers. They make the show possible and keep us commercial free. Head over to GMWordoftheWeek.com and click the yellow banner at the top to find our support page and join them. Every bit helps. Once again, we are indebted to the book Persian Fire by Tom Holland. You can find a link to it on Amazon in our episode description. We'll be hearing more from it in future episodes. This episode was researched, written, and produced by Brian Casey, who could probably finish in the top five of a summarized Proust competition. Music was provided by Blue Dot Sessions. O oh man, whoever you are and wherever you come from, for I know you will come. I am Cyrus, who won the Persians their empire. Do not, therefore, begrudge me this bit of earth that covers my bones.